manually. Okay, so we're going to continue now with our discussion about interchanging operations. If you want to stay in a math department, this is something you have to care about. If you don't really care about justifying this rigorously, where can you go? Physics, Physics or even worse? Econ, right? <laughs> Anything like that, it would be absolutely fine. But in the math department, we are extremely concerned about when can we justify stuff like this. So as a good example, let's take a geometric series. Do you guys prefer the letter X, the letter R, or does it not matter? Does not matter, right? You prefer R? <laughs> All right, for those of you at home, I apologize for the strength of the Boston accent. So f of r is the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity of r to the n. And note, of course, that f maps r to r. OK. But of course, you could extend this and it maps what? Yeah, so with my accent, let's try to cut down on some of the r's. All right. So we want to figure out, is the derivative of the sum the sum of the derivatives? Let's think back to Calc 1. In Calc 1, you prove the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives when you have two terms, right? And so you go through the proof. It's pretty standard. How would you prove the derivative of a sum of three terms is the sum of the three derivatives? Well, in Calc 1, let's say you have f plus g plus h, and you want the derivative. This is a proof by grouping or parentheses. And what you do is it's f plus g plus h prime. And if you look at it like this, well, by induction, well, I'm sorry, I already know the derivative of a sum of two terms is the sum of the derivatives. So this is now just f plus g prime plus h prime. And now, again, this is just two things, so I'm OK. It's f prime plus g prime plus h prime. So in the range of you know, calc 1, this is not so bad. This proves a sum of three terms. Its derivative is the sum of the derivatives. If I had four terms, lots of ways to do it. And in fact, as a nice problem, you can think, how many ways can I put in parentheses to give myself different valid proofs that this works? That could be a nice exercise. Doesn't matter, there's at least one. But it's extremely important that this only works for finite numbers. So this is only for finite sums. Okay, so since it's only for finite sums, we need something that's going to work in general. Now, one of them is to use the you know, nuclear approach to mathematics. You prove this big, powerful theorem, which then includes this as a little, little, little special case. Right? And so one of the homework problems is to show that if I have an infinite sum within the range, you know, if I'm in the region of the uh, you know, convergence, if I'm within that row, then I can differentiate term by term. I get a new series that also converges, and that equals the derivative. And you know, the hint you were given was to start off with the definition of the derivative and work along those lines. That's overkill for this problem. It's fine. We're happy to do this as mathematicians. But for this particular problem, we can attack it elementarily and directly. And the reason is the geometric series has a lot of wonderful properties. Anybody know what's the most useful property of a geometric series right now? Yeah. Yes? It has a closed form. It has a closed form. And so that's going to be extremely useful because now if we want to try to differentiate term by term, we know what it's supposed to be. So um, the sum of r to the n, n goes from 0 to infinity, is 1 minus r to the negative 1. There's another way I can write it, though. I can write it as a finite sum, 1 plus r to the n minus 1 plus the sum n equals n to infinity of r to the n. Now, this finite sum I can understand very easily. Why is this a good way to break up the geometric series? And uh, you, you want to try it? Or? OK. We're only going to be differentiating when the absolute value of r is you know, strictly less than 1. What can you tell me about this final sum? Okay, not only does it get very small, that's going to be true of 
any series that converges, right? That's generic. I want specific now. Do you know anything about that sum, the sum of the tails, the sum of the error in the approximation? Does that look familiar to you? What is this tail equal to? It has a name. I will rewrite it in a more illuminating manner. At least if I'm a good professor, it'll be more illuminating. What can I factor out of every single term there? R to the n. And now I'm left with the sum. n goes from 0 to infinity of r to the n. What do I have now? I have the original series. I have a geometric series. And so I actually know a close form expression for this. Multiplied now by an r to the n. So there's lots of ways I can do the algebra now. And so one possibility is I can now just take the derivative of both sides and work with it because this is just 1 minus r inverse is 1 plus dot 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 plus r to the n plus r to the n over 1 minus r. And now I have a finite sum. I can differentiate term by term. And so now if I take the derivative, I get negative. 1 minus r to the negative 2, a negative from that becomes a positive. I get 1 minus r to the negative 2. And then here I'll write, you know, it's a sum. k goes from 0. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm doing this to, to n minus 1, I think. Doesn't matter, but. So I'll get k r to the k minus 1. Now I have to take the derivative of this. What rule do I use? Quotient, right? So I get to use some old stuff in calculus. Uh, right, so it's n r to the n minus 1 times 1 minus r minus r to the n. Derivative of 1 minus r is negative 1 over 1 minus r squared. Right, now if I look at this expression, as big n goes to infinity, what can I say about this term? Well, I have an r to the n which is going to go to 0 fast. And then I have n r to the n. That's going to go to 0 as well. And so as the absolute value of r is less than 1, n r to the n goes to 0 fast. And if you're not sure how to do this, you can use L'Hopital's rule. You know, because r is strictly less than 1, I could write r as 1 over, say, big R, where big R is greater than 1. I'll have n over r to the n. And then you can see very fast decay. So now this is going to go to 0. So now if I take the limit as n goes to infinity, this is valid for each n. Right? This expression is valid for each n. So if I take the limit as n goes to infinity, this piece goes to 0, and that converges to the sum we want. So now just take limit as n goes to infinity. So there's a lot of great ideas in this proof, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this. I've introduced an auxiliary cut. Does it really matter where I cut it? I have freedom to choose what big N is. And I just let big N be something large, and then it gives me a manageable piece over here. So this is one way to handle the problem. There's a slightly different way I could have done this. It's essentially the same calculation, but it's a, it's a little bit different way of emphasizing the algebra. And so once we're all happy with this, uh, let me know, and I will show you the other way of looking at it. Any Les Miserables fans? The musical Les Miserables? Nobody? All right, one of the hardest songs uh, for the uh, lead Jean Valjean to sing is Bring Him Home. Okay, if you've ever heard that song, it's a very tough song to hit a lot of the notes in that. I have a method that I call Bring It Home after a Williams student from a couple of years ago who gave that a really good name. You have the same expression on both sides. When you have the same expression on both sides of an equation, you can combine and solve. So has everybody written this down, or do you want me to leave this on the board a little bit longer? Leave it a few seconds longer. All right. So what I'll do is I'll just start erasing over here. I'll just work over here. All right. So what we can do is we can go back to what we had before. And what we had before was, oh, is it already stopping to work? 
i. There we go. We can go back to what we had before, and we can write 1 minus r inverse is the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1, r to the k, plus r to the n, 1 minus r inverse. Well, I have 1 minus r inverse. I can subtract, and I get 1 minus r to the n, 1 minus r inverse is the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of r to the k. I can write this as 1 minus r to the n times f of r is the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 r to the k. And now, how can I find r prime? I just use the product rule. And so if I use the product rule, I get the derivative of this, which is negative r to the n minus 1 times f of r plus 1 minus r to the n f prime of r is the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of k r to the k minus 1. And so I'll call this the bring it over method. So again, lots of good things to see here. And when you look at this now, if I now send n to infinity, well, this is going to be completely destroyed. The r to the n is going to kill the f of r, and this over here is going to converge to 1, so you'll get f prime of r converges to that as well. Not surprisingly, you regain the old result. Right? You should definitely get the same result back. So again, it's two different ways of looking at the same computation if you're feeling extremely generous. Right? This is really the same calculation. It's how do I want to present the algebra. As you go further in mathematics, how you present the algebra is extremely important. Different ways will look more attractable, more manageable to you. And so if you, see, if you ever see the same quantity on both sides, this is a great thing to do. You might see some integrals um, years ago, maybe in Calc 1, Calc 2, where you're integrating things involving cosines and sines, and you integrate by parts twice, and you get back the original integral you want, but now it's weighted by some factor. Maybe it's weighted by a quarter. Bring it over to the other side, you get 3 fourths of the integral you don't know is equal to an integral you know. And so this is an extremely powerful method. OK, any questions on the proof that we can differentiate the geometric series term by term? So again, what's nice about this is we don't have to use the full general theory. We can just use the fact that in the special case of a geometric series, we understand the tail completely. Now, what's crucial over here in the second approach is that the tail itself is the original function. It has the same functional form. So in some sense, for those of you who are doing some Benford work with me, you can think of the stable distributions where you get back what you started. And this is extremely rare to have something like that. If we were to look at the exponential function, the exponential function has much better convergence than the geometric series. The geometric series only converges if the absolute value of r is less than 1. The geometric series is limited. It's restricted. The exponential function converges for all values. But the tail of the exponential does not have a nice closed form expression, whereas the tail of the geometric series does. And so when you're doing these analyses, if you can control the tail completely, that's wonderful. For a lot of problems, we actually estimate the error by replacing the error with some kind of geometric series that converges. We often give up a little bit when we do this, but frequently the main error term is the first dropped term. And so the amount you're losing is, or the amount you're changing by is so insignificant, it's often worth it to simplify the calculation. All right. How many of you have seen differentiating identities? There's got to be at least three people in this class who have seen it because I know I taught it to them. All right, so if you haven't seen differentiating identities, I want to just quickly do that as an application of why you care about stuff like this. So application, differentiating identities. So in mathematics, identities are our bread and butter. We do a lot of work to prove identities. And so I know I sound like a you know, used car salesman or you know, Ginsu knives, whatever you want to see on those you know, you know, home shopping networks. You know, what do you think about this new procedure that you buy one identity and I will give you infinitely many more identities for free? Right? Sound too good to be true? It could be yours for just $19.95 a month. <laughs> right? You do want to make sure you subscribe to the online update so you keep getting the new identities of one a month. Right? 
What's nice about different identities is you start off with one identity and you create infinitely many more. So frequently where this might occur is probability. So for example, you know, moments. You might have the expected value in probability of x to the k would be maybe the sum of um, n to the k probability x equals n. And you know, let, let's assume that my random variable only takes on non-negative integers as values. So it just makes things a little bit easier. So I might care about some sums like this. The moments of the distribution give me information about its shape. The method of differentiating identities allows us to calculate something like that. So for example, what is the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of 1 half to the n? Who can do this in their head quickly? One. Two. Two. Yeah. Right. Because I'm starting at zero, not at one. What is the sum n goes from zero to infinity of n over two to the n? Not two n. Can't be two n because I've summed over n. So just drop the n and you're correct. It's also two. Yeah. And so here's the proof. f of r is the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of r to the n. And let's apply the operator r d by dr. So I'm going to take the derivative of both sides with respect to r. Why am I going to multiply by r? Because at the end of the day, I want to keep the power of r to be n. And so if I apply you know, the operator r d by dr, I get r f prime of r. Well, I know a closed form expression for the geometric series. It's equal to 1 over 1 minus r. Um, so when I take the derivative and multiply by r, I get r over 1 minus r squared. And now, I just take the sum and goes from 0 to infinity, and I'll get n r to the n. So I get n r to the n minus 1, but then I multiply by r, the power comes back up. And now I just take r equals 1 half and we're done. You we're within the region where it converges, everything is fine. So this allows us to calculate values of this sum extremely easily. If I want to calculate n squared over 2 to the n, could I do that? If we wanted to do n squared over 2 to the n, could we do that? Yeah, what would we have to do? Yes? Apply the same operator again. Apply the same operator again. So if I want to get n squared, every time I apply r d by dr, I bring down an n at the nth term. If I want to get n cubed, I just apply it three times. So now the question is, is there a nice, simple, closed form expression if I want to say have n to the 389? Yes, there will be an answer to it. Can you sniff out the pattern with something like this? So there's a lot of stuff you can do with differentiating identities. I will try to post some additional material on this if people are interested as to how you can use differentiating identities to calculate more expressions, more theorems, more results. But I hope this gives you a sense of how powerful this technique is and why we care about being able to differentiate. So because we've you know, shown that this is useful, a natural question to ask is, do we really have to be this careful? Is it maybe the case that the physicists and the economists are right and you don't have to worry about these convergence issues? What do you think? Do you think the physicists and the economists are always right? No. So the question is, can you come up with a series where you cannot differentiate term by term? So for example, uh, uh, so let's call it a troublesome function. Let's let f sub a b of x be the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of cosine n to the ax divided by n to the b. So whenever you name something, you want to have good names. 
Right? If Nike is willing to sponsor this class, I am happy to call this function Nike. If Reebok bids more or Under Armour bids more, I will drop them and change the name. You know, sadly, none of these companies have responded to entreaties, so I will give it a name like this. Why do I want to call it F sub AB? Why, why is this a good name? Depends on your choice of AB, and this reminds us of that. Uh, other notations which people would sometimes use is maybe f of x with the semicolon AB to just remind you that there's two other parameters that are of importance here. And depending on your choices of A and B, this function could be easy or hard to understand. What would be a condition you might like on B? I'm sorry? Uh, if b is 0, then we have the sum of the cosine of n a n to the a x, which is not, which is not going to converge for most value. In fact, it will never converge, because this will just cycle around. So if b equals 0, we're in trouble. If b is negative, we're in big trouble. OK? Good. The larger b is, the faster it converges. So can somebody give me a value of b where you start to feel comfortable? Yes. Two. two. <laughs> All right, can you do a little bit better than two? Yes. Anything greater than Anything one. Anything greater than one. OK. Anything greater than one, we're fine. The numerator is at most one. It's bounded. Then this function, this is, you know, in the calculus classes, they call it a p-series. Pains me as a number theorist to use p for something like that. But it would be a p-series with p greater than one. It would converge. And if you just rotate b a little bit, you'll get a p. OK. You can actually do better than b is greater than 1. What do you think I need b to b for this to converge? I think you can do even better than that. Yes? Positive. This is like limbo. How low can you go? I believe you can make it work as long as b is greater than 0. So it's a nice exercise. Does this converge? if b is greater than 0. When I say converge, what kind of convergence do I mean? Absolute. Conditional. Conditional. If I put in absolute values, I'm going to be dead. <laughs> and if I put in absolute values, I want b to be greater than 1. Yes? And you'd have to like, say for any a. And then the question is for what values of a is going to matter. And I think, it would, I think for any value of a, as long as b is greater than 0, I believe we're fine. But I'm not positive. Uh, you would have to check. If a equals 1, it's not so bad. Well, if a equals 0, well, if a equals zero then that's, that's very nice. Right. If a equals 0, we can just pull, pull this out. You could, uh, but then I wouldn't be able to write it like this. And so here I'm assuming a and b are fixed constants. And that's why, in fact, I'm using notation like this. All right, so let's take b equals 2. Let's take a equals 1. Are you guys comfortable with these values? This function converges. Does it converge uniformly? I'm sorry, does it converge absolutely if a equals 1 and b equals 2? Yeah, I've got a sum of 1 over n squared. And so now, if I look at f prime of 1, 2 of x, if I can differentiate term by term, that's a sum n goes from 0 to infinity, derivative of cosine minus sign. So the way I always remember it is you have to remember where the minus sign goes. It's minus sign. All right? So we have a negative sine of n to the a x times n to the a over n to the b. Well, in our problem, a equals 1, b equals 2. So we get the following. What do you think? Converge or diverge? Diverge. I'm not sure. So why do you think it might diverge? I think that's a great thing to think it might diverge. What is giving you some trepidation? The harmonic series diverges. But why might it converge? Because it's like almost an alternating series whose terms go to zero. 
Yeah, so, I mean, we do have an alternating series. I mean, with cosine, the danger is if I take x equals 0, I have cosine which is always at 0, which is always at 1. If I take x equals 0, the sine of 0 is 0. So I think I might actually always have enough oscillation here that this might converge conditionally but not absolutely. Okay, so I'm not sure. You know, this is the nice thing about teaching a class like this. I don't have to know the answer. I can just leave it for you. What would be a better or worse choice of a and b? b equals 2, a equals 2. Let's go, let's go even higher. Let's take a equals 3, right? You know, right? Give yourself plenty of wiggle room so that you're you know, very comfortable. f3, 2 prime of x, you know, if I now were able to differentiate term by term and would go from 0 to infinity, I'll get minus sine of n cubed x. Then I'll have a n cubed over n squared times n. Okay, clearly this is not going to work. So we're now at a point where we will not be able to differentiate term by term. Uh, later in the chapter on Fourier analysis, there's a section on, on Weierstrass's continuous but nowhere differentiable function. And the first time I saw this in a textbook, it talked about Weierstrass coming up with a function which distressed 19th century mathematicians. And I loved that word, <laughs> distressed. And it was a function that was given by a series expansion which converged. But you could not differentiate it term by term and say it was the derivative. And so in fact, most functions, if you put the proper notion of size on the space, most functions are differentiable nowhere. Fortunately, the functions which are differentiable are a dense set of functions in many spaces. And we can approximate a lot of things with these functions and use this for the analysis. All right, so this should hopefully give you some examples. So hopefully if you have seen some of this material before, you've at least seen some new things now and have a better appreciation of why we have to spend so much time being so careful about all of this. Okay? And again, when you differentiate, there is enormous difficulty with stuff like this. Okay. So what I want to do now is move to one of the most important functions in all of mathematics, the exponential function. Okay. Okay. So the exponential function. So there are two definitions of e to the x. One is the infinite series expansion. One of them is the limit. So it's 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus dot dot dot. It's the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. It's also the limit as m goes to infinity of 1 plus x over m to the m. And the equant department is much happier, I think, with the second one for a lot of things, you know, compound interest. You know, that's where you might have seen something like this before. All right. When you see this expansion, you want to differentiate it term by term. And if you differentiate term by term, you'll get x to the n becomes n x to the n minus 1. The n over n factorial, the n's cancel, you get a n minus 1 factorial. And you can see if differentiate term by term, the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. And that's a wonderful property for a function to have. Okay, um, how would we prove this? So one thing is we could try to go through the argument very carefully and try to mimic what we did for the geometric series. The difficulty there is we will not have a closed form expression for the tail. So we would have to argue in some sense very similar to what we do in the general case, that if you have a series that converges inside the radius of convergence, you can differentiate term by term. So you can now begin to see why we care so much about that exercise. This is not just a bookkeeping uh, make work problem. This is crucial to our understanding. Okay, I'm assuming everybody has seen this definition of e to the x. What's nice is this definition makes sense for all values of x, because all I'm doing is I'm doing sums and I'm doing integral powers. What is e to the x times e to the y? e to the x plus y. This has to be proved. If this were not the case, mathematicians would be guilty of sins of notation. Now, we are guilty at times of sins of notation. What is 1 over cosine? 
What's one over sine? Yes. To me, I would much rather have the cosine and the cosecant together and the sine and the secant together. We have 1 over cosine goes to secant. There are times when we do not necessarily have the best notation. We have disagreements with physics all the time as to how to define things, how to normalize things. We should not use notation like this unless it were true. So this has to be proved. And the way it's proved is what does this mean? It means the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of x to the n over n factorial times the sum, m goes from 0 to infinity, of y to the m over m factorial equals the sum, k goes from 0 to infinity, of x plus y to the k over k factorial. But this is something that has to be proved. Now what's nice is these series converge very rapidly. And so anything you want to do can be justified. And this allows us to illustrate one of the most important techniques in mathematics. It's basically rearranging summations. How many people want to see the calculation for why this works? All right, enough, enough, enough hands are going up. For those of you who did not put up your hands, I hope you're either just shy or you don't mind seeing it then. So why not? So if you said, this is actually my favorite expression to say. Somebody just said, why not? How do you read this? <laughs> this is z not not not. All right. So proof. If you think about what's going on, when we have a sum over m, sum over n, we're either doing it all the vertical sums first and then the horizontal sums of all the different columns, or maybe we're doing all the rows first, all the horizontal sums, and then summing all over the rows. What we're going to do is we're going to rearrange the double sum, and we're going to do it now like this. And that's essentially the proof. And so if we look at you know, the sum over m, sum over n of x to the n, y to the m over n factorial, m factorial, what we're going to do is we're going to collect all values of m and n such that the sum is equal to k. So this is the sum, k goes from 0 to infinity, the sum, l goes from 0 to k, x to the n, well, I'll call it this way, x to the l, y to the k minus l over l factorial, k minus l factorial. And the way you prove that this can all be done is if you put in absolute values. If everything converges with absolute values, then you can drop the absolute values at the end. So I'm not going to really worry about the absolute values because we have such rapid convergence. So I'm looking at this. Does this denominator look familiar to you? Yes. It looks like you know, the bottom half of a binomial coefficient. I want a k factorial up top. I'm not allowed to just put in a k factorial, so I have to divide by a k factorial, so I get a sum k goes from 0 to infinity, 1 over k factorial. The sum, l goes from 0 to k of k choose l, x to the l, y to the k minus l. Ah, well now looking at that, this is just x plus y to the k. That's the binomial theorem. So now, k goes from 0 to infinity. And this is just the binomial theorem. And there's the proof. And now, by definition, that's just e to the x plus y. So again, you want to go through this carefully and see why it's true. But essentially, what's going on is this is a proof by using the binomial theorem. All right, so I want to give you some examples of why we care about the exponential function. Yes? Do we have to worry about, like, in the first uh, thing here, it's, that's different from what we start with on the, left, on the left over there? So what we start on the left with, with the sum over n, sum over m, yeah. I can move this inside the m sum. That's okay. Well, because, because this has no, if I fix n, but again, the way you do this all very rigorously is you show if you put in absolute values, then the thing converges. And if it converges with absolute values, then it converges without them. 
And that's always the difficulty is that whenever you have infinities, you could have infinities canceling. And this is, you know, the Fubini theorem, you can interchange orders of integration so long as you have a finite region and the integral over the finite region is finite, or if you have an infinite region, if the integral of the absolute value is finite. Okay. So let's do a couple of applications of this. So applications. All right. Derivative of x squared. If you want an M and M, I can't really make it much easier in Math 389. All right, derivative of x squared. Two x. All right. X to the three halves. It's derivative. Yeah, I was getting a little worried when I heard the ah. Right. And then one more. X to the root two. All right, root 2, x to the root 2, minus 1. So all the answers are correct, but the proofs of these three statements are actually very different. The way we prove this is, you know, definition of derivative and the binomial theorem. You know, we can look at x plus h squared minus x to the h, and we can expand. Right? If I gave you x plus h cubed, x plus h to the fourth, that's fine. We can just expand. We have the binomial theorem. We actually don't need the full strength of the binomial theorem. We just need to know that it looks like x to the n plus n h x to the n minus 1 plus order of h squared. In fact, that's, that's the amount we need. For x to the 3 halves, the way we would prove something like this is, let's let f of x be x to the 3 halves. If we let g of x be f of x squared, that becomes x cubed. And now we know how to differentiate g. So now we get g prime of x. And now by the product rule, this would be 2 f of x, f prime of x is 3x squared. So solving for f prime of x, we get f prime of x is 3 halves x squared over f of x. But f of x is x to the 3 halves, so this would become 3 halves x to the 1 half. And of course, there's nothing special about the algebra here when I take 3 halves. This works for any rational. OK, it's much harder now to get x to the root 2. In fact, it shouldn't even be clear what x to the root 2 means. The way we handle this is x to the root 2 is e to the root 2 natural log of x. And now we have a series expansion for e to the blah. So this makes sense for any choice of blah. I can take blah to be root 2 log x. And now all I'm using is I'm using integral powers, which is fine, and I'm using addition, which is fine. And now I have basically a chain rule problem. And I can take the derivative of this without any trouble. But the derivative of these facts is, uh, is you know, very different. OK. So you know, next big result about the exponential function, and now we're finally going to get to the Fourier analysis stuff. Uh, key formulas. So this is often called Euler or Euler-Coates, I think. e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. In high school, I think they might call this cis theta sometimes, if you're at least really old. And so one way to prove this is to you know, proof Taylor series. Calculate the derivative of sine, calculate the derivative of cosine, calculate the derivative of exponential, and then just show everything works. And you basically use the fact that you know, i is the square root of negative 1, i to the fourth is 1. And so things are going to cycle. So in the cosine and the sine in the Taylor series expansions, cosine is only going to have even terms, even powers. Sine is only going to have odd powers. The sines are going to alternate plus 1, minus 1, because every time you go up by 2, you have an i squared, which is a minus 1. So if you just calculate the Taylor series expansions, you see everything agrees. Okay, This is an extremely useful formula. So 
consequences. e to the i theta times e to the minus i theta, what does that equal? One. It's e to the 0, which is 1. But this is the same as cosine theta plus i sine theta times cosine theta minus i sine theta equals 1. When you expand, you get cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. This is? There we go, it's Pythagoras. That's not a bad consequence. So we have five minutes. I'll give you all of trigonometry in five minutes. All right. Every trig identity you can want comes from these facts. And so what goes on here is we're using two things. We're using the fact that cosine theta plus i sine theta is e to the i theta. And we're using, so we're using 1 e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. And we're using e to the i theta, e to the i phi is e to the i theta plus phi. So for example, e to the i theta, e to the i phi is e to the i theta plus phi, as claimed. Cosine theta plus i sine theta cosine phi plus i sine phi. And what does the right-hand side equal? I'm probably should use my right hand. What does the right-hand side equal? What does that equal? And now all we have to do is expand the right-hand side. And so when we expand the right-hand side, we get cosine theta, cosine phi, minus i times i is minus 1, sine theta, sine phi, that's the real part, plus i sine theta, cosine phi, plus cosine theta, sine phi. Well, the only way two complex numbers can be equal is the real parts equal, the imaginary parts equal. Set reals equal, set imaginaries equal. This gives us the, I'll call it the angle addition formulas. So if you think about what's going on, the reason we're getting these angle addition formulas is because what's really happening is sines and cosines are inheriting this from the exponential function. And the exponential function has this really nice uh, exponential of x, exponential y, exponential x plus y, sines and cosines inherit that as well. That's really where all this comes from. So in fact, you know, going back to key formulas, doing a little bit of algebra, we can solve. And we can write cosine theta is e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over 2. Sine of theta is e to the minus, I'm sorry, e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta all over 2i. You can get hyperbolic cosine. Cosh of theta is e to the theta plus uh, e to the minus theta over 2. Cinch, or hyperbolic sine of theta, is e to the theta minus e to the minus theta over 2. What's another way of writing cosh theta? I claim you can write it in terms of other functions on the board, and there aren't that many. Uh, yes, but I can do a little bit better. Yeah, it's the same as cosine of i theta. Okay, because if I just formally plug in, so if somebody asks you, what is the cosine of root 2i? You can now calculate the cosine of root 2i. 
If any of you are Foxtrot fans, I'll send you one of my favorite Foxtrot comic strips involving hyperbolic trigonometry. These are extremely useful functions. Uh, when you're solving a lot of you know, differential equations, these are different combinations of the exponential functions. And it turns out taking combinations like this is very useful. Doing combinations one way, I get the sines and the cosines. This is when I have my periodic solutions. If I have my exponentially growing decaying solutions, then what I have is I have my hyperbolics. So I'm going to end the day with a picture. You will either love this picture or hate this picture, but hopefully it will allow you to appreciate why all of this stuff is useful. So angle addition. So here's theta. Here's phi. This whole angle is theta plus phi. So if I want to calculate the sine, the sine of this is this length over here. I can draw the perpendicular down to here. I can then draw the perpendicular down to here. If this is theta, this is 90 minus theta, 90 minus theta. So this is theta up over here. So this length over here, um, I can get in many different ways. You can start playing all the different games. Uh, you need to draw one more line. And then if I want to get the length of this line here, it's this segment plus this segment. I have my angle up over here. If this is 1, what is the length of this line over here? We're running out of time. I need you to answer fast. This over here, what's the length of this? This is just sine of phi, right? So this is sine of phi. Now I have a right triangle over here where the hypotenuse is sine of phi. I have an angle of theta. The adjacent side is cosine of theta times the hypotenuse. So this length over here is going to be cosine theta sine of phi. And you can see there's half of the angle addition formula for sine. And by doing similar work, you can get the other half and get a much greater appreciation of you know, why we like these exponential functions and how much simpler it makes the geometry, rather than having to go through all these painful calculations. All right, so this is a good place to stop, so let's stop here. <laughs>